All right, good morning, Hi. everyone who's here live. Good morning or afternoon to those joining later uh, remotely. This is Jonas. He's going to be Hi. my assistant today. Hi. They're, they're in my headphones, so you won't be able to hear them if they talk. But. Oh. All right, so uh, last week we talked about setting type. Today we're going to talk about printing. For the most part, um, you won't see our faces too much. I've got the camera set up to be close in on the press and close in on the type. And that's what we'll be doing for, for most of today. So you will mostly see the press over here once we get to the operation of it here in a few minutes. And you will see the type that we have set up. I made that one. Here. Yep. All right, so actually I'm going to set this up so that we can see both of them simultaneously. All right, so we've got the press in one place and we've got the um, document type. camera in the other. All right, well, we'll start with the, the text. Mine's a bit weird. All right. <laughs> so we've got two things set up here. This is a text that I prepared for today. Um, I won't give away what it is yet, although if you can read a mirror image, you might be able to tell what it is. Um, and I've already got it all set up, ready to print. And then Jonas's text that he set is not quite ready, and it will allow me to show you a couple of things. So the first thing that I wanted to show is the reason why uh, we're so careful and precise when we're thinking about uh, making everything line up and so forth with these texts. So as I said, this is, this is loose type, you know, it's movable. And we talked about type as being a valuable resource. Um, you want it to be as portable as possible in the print shop because once we've printed something, we want to be able to take that type, we want to be able to put it back in the case and use it for a new job. Um, type is valuable, and when type is material, when you a font is actually a set of letter forms, um, you can't use it if it's being used for something else. That feels obvious to say, but it's not a paradigm we're used to, and you're typing, you don't run out of Garamond as you're typing, right? But in a print shop, if your Garamond was all being used to print a particular book, um, and someone else wanted something printed in Garamond, uh, you don't have any because it's all locked up in the book that you're printing, right? Okay, so something that's well composed though, where there's spacers all the way to the edge of the lead, it's nice and square, we should, should be fairly portable. We can use, we can manipulate the text like an, like an object. I can exert pressure around it, and even though it's loose type, I can actually pick it up without that type falling if I exert pressure all the way around it because it's nice and square, and I can just hold it together like that. When we print a text, like we're about to do here, we actually have a chase. The chase is made for the press. It's custom. This is a very teeny tiny chase for this little teeny tiny press that I have here. And uh, we put the text blocks in. You can see the lead and the text here. There's two columns in this text that I've set, right? We have to think in mirror image. So if you want something you know, in two columns, the ultimate left-hand column needs to be over here in the right and the right-hand column over here on the left. And then we use this wooden material, which I have a whole box of over here which is called furniture. And we use the furniture to build out to the edges of the chase. This chase is very full. Uh, when we put Jonas's text in the same chase, it won't be quite as full. We don't have to fill every gap in the chase with furniture. We just have to fill um, enough that we can exert pressure in both directions to squeeze the text this way and to squeeze the text this way. Now this, text that I set was sort of very wide for this chase and didn't even leave room for these little guys on the side. These are called coins and coins are usually what you use to tighten the text. So you get everything pretty flush in the chase 
you've got furniture almost to the edge, but not like completely to the edge. And then you use these little coins to tighten. They have springs in them and they expand when I turn this, which is called the key. I insert the key into the coin. And when I say coin, it's Q-U-O-I-N-S. Um, so weird spelling. Um, when I turn the key in the coin, the springs, it expands and it tightens and it holds everything in place. So that again, this is loose type, but I can pick it up. I can move it. You can see on the back that it's loose. You can see the backs of all the pieces of type, but it, you've not seen that before, bud. Yeah, it's pretty, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's all uh, locked in and ready to go. So we will print this one first. And then we will come over here and I will show how we do lock up for yours. Oh. Sound like a plan? All right, so I'm going to switch my camera real quick over to the press. And there's Joe. All right, so I'm going to take my form. This press that we're using here, it's very small. In many ways, it's sort of a hobbyist press. This would not have been a workhorse in any print shop ever. This would have been really for maybe very tiny jobs, um, but mostly a sort of hobbyist machine. Maybe advertisements? Maybe, but mostly probably home printers. <laughs> but it is a design on the same principle as uh, some workhorse presses, including the big one that we have at Husqvarna on campus. We have a very big golden pearl press. It stands, you know, almost as tall as me. And um, it operates by a foot treadle rather than a handle like this one does. But the way this works is that we are going to take, oh, you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. We haven't inked the press. I need to take the type out. Let's ink the press first, Joe. Okay. So I'm just going to put, yep, thank you. So in the uh, sort of, print shop through essentially the 18th century when you were using like the English common press or things that are sort of derived from Gutenberg's press, operating a press was, you know, a three or four person operation. You had one person who would put the paper down. You had one person who would ink the type. The type sat in a flat bed and you would ink it with these balls covered in ink. You'd pat the ink down. Another person would put the paper in, he would slide the text under the press, and then someone would pull that big lever that you saw in the Stephen Fry video to exert pressure. These platen style presses combine a lot of the, those features into one and allow one person to essentially operate all the stages of the printing process. Um, do you want to do it? I want to kind of do it slowly and show what's happening with this press. So. You saw me, I applied ink up here on this disc. This is the ink disc. It's kind of like a painter's palette in a way. And I apply just a little drop of ink. And then down here are these rollers. The rollers come up, they grab the ink and they come down. And you will see that once, sorry, it's, it really should be uh, locked. <laughs> I should uh, screw it into something, but since this is a temporary operation, I've not done that. Oh, you know what? I need to, hang on, Joe. I need to make an adjustment here. These things are not far enough back. My guide's here. Hang on. This is why I have tools right here in the press. These need to sit much further back. They are interfering with the operation of the rollers. These are the guides to keep the paper from sticking to the okay. type. All right. So as the um, the aren't the guides are not working. Yeah, the guides are being a little tricky. I need to figure out what we're getting stuck. Probably not taking Can I do some? Off. Hang on one second, okay. All 
All right. Oh, I see they keep yeah, that's resting weird. right there. It's weird. It's strange because this wasn't happening yesterday. All right. Well, wait. Putting in. All right. Sorry. Temporary challenge. I just didn't have it locked enough. It was listing forward too much. No, I just want the second camera to be on the share. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. All right, so I just want to show them what's happening. Give me one second, okay? So the rollers are coming up and they are grabbing ink and sinking the rollers, but that dinging sound you hear is there's this little piece of metal that comes, <laughs> buddy, you're right in front of the camera. <laughs> there's a little piece of metal that comes into the back of, there's a gear on the back of this disc. It comes into contact with that and it spins the disc and that keeps the ink distributed around the disc so that you get a nice even layer of ink rather than having the ink pool at the bottom of the press or the bottom of the ink disc or anything like that. Yeah, you can do a couple, all right? Go it a few times. Yep, good. And down. Good. And down. So what we want is a nice even layer of ink up here on the ink disc, which we've got a pretty good layer now. Yeah, that looks nice. And we are going to put our text in. So here we have the type and we are going to, there's a little place that it can rest right here inside the press and a little lever that grabs a ridge up on the top of this. And I remember that I was working it this way yesterday. Oh, All right, so now it's rolled in there. And now what's going to happen, as you can see, is that every time I operate the press, as the ink rollers go up and down, they are actually going to put ink on the type. Now, the first couple prints we make are really just going to be about inking the type. They're not going to be a good impression yet. But once I've got some ink on the type, I can make a full impression. And it's going to look terrible because I printed it about 50 times. Yeah. Now let's print just one. <laughs> you can see my proof which looks bad because I was using it as I inked the type. But now I'm going to put my card here. Oh, and I can see that it's looking okay, but it's not looking great. Usually when you do a job, the first couple of prints are proof prints because you've got to adjust the inking and things like that to make it work. And when you've got sort of light areas of inking and so forth, there's a couple of things you can do. This is called the tympan, this backing that, it's, uh, that the paper rests on. And the tympan can actually be, I can open this up and I can put material inside the tympan, which is referred to as packing. And packing material, basically just you use uh, old paper, you can use uh, other kinds of uh, specialized paper and even very thin cardboard sometimes and it increases the pressure a little bit it adds to the pressure and sometimes you add packing across the whole tympan and sometimes if you're prepping a job that you're going to be printing for a while you will actually uh, figure out where like a light area of uh, print is and you will just put a little bit of extra packing there it's actually a pretty fine operation when we work in the press and I've got students you know printing one after the other after the other we do not do much to adjust the packing because uh, we're only making a few prints of each one and it's not really 
worth all of the effort to adjust the packing for every single job. But if we were making hundreds or thousands of the same print, we absolutely would want to adjust the packing in order to make it work. And just to give you an illustration of how packing changes things, I'll just show you what happens if I kind of pack a little bit of packing by just putting two pieces of paper rather than one. Oop, you can see the pressure has adjusted. And I've gotten a much cleaner print. And still, my making down there is still very lightly inked. And if I'm, before I make 100 or 200 of these, I would absolutely want to adjust the packing or figure out why the pressure is strange there. You can see I'm printing the, the last lines of the Ken Liu story that we read in class. And I thought I'd do it in two columns so that it would be sort of like a little postcard book. <laughs> that was the idea there. Okay, but I wanna show you what lockup looks like. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time trying to get this perfect. Instead, I am going to take this text out. We'll clean off the ink here later. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm gonna clean off the ink now before, before I unlock it. You always wanna clean it before you unlock it. Well, no, just think, imagine if I was trying to clean it with all that type loose. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really hard, right? No. So I do, we do most of our cleaning in the shop with mineral spirits, which are pretty, uh... oh, thank you, bud. We do most of our cleaning with mineral spirits, which are pretty non-abrasive. And I've just got some old cut up t-shirts that I'm using as my shop rags down here. And what I was telling Joe is that if you're going to clean a bunch of type, you want to clean it while it's all locked up. Because once I unlock it and every piece of type is individual, I wouldn't be able to just wipe right across it like that and clean off all that ink. Now, some people ask about multicolor printing. One thing to keep in mind with a press like this is that our printing process is essentially one at a time. So we can print with our black, but if we wanted to apply two colors, we would need to have two different sort of setups of type the bits that need to be in black, the bits that need to be in, say, blue, um, with the spacing, you know, to, to make sure that we were printing on top, unless we were trying to print colors on top of other colors. And then we would have to do one pass in black and one pass in blue. We can't print multiple colors at the same time. Okay, so we are going to unlock my type. Although I'm going to leave it all in place because I think that I will want to... Uh, use this again. And I'm going to even undo my crazy kind of version of furniture over here that I use because this was such a tight lockup for this tiny little chase. I'm going to take this out. And when I take it out, I'm going to, because I might want to print some more of these, in fact, and figure out my inking issue. So I'm going to go ahead and put some furniture around this just to hold it in place. And now we're going to do lock in for Joe's. Okay. Hang on, let me get to this camera so folks can see what's going on. All right, Joe, we're going to do this together because I'm conscious of time, OK? okay. Let this refocus. There we go. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Joe used much shinier type than mine, so the light is uh, <laughs> playing some tricks. So we're going to start with a coin, because I know I'm going to want a coin on this side. And actually, with yours, Joe, we will be able to use a coin on the side here as well. And then, as I said, we don't actually have to fill all the space. All we have to do is fill space that will, you know, sort of exert pressure in the directions that we need to exert pressure. And we'll see if one 
coin is going to be sufficient here, or if we end up needing two, I think one will be fine. I'm just sort of flagging that as a potential thing we need to think about. And it's sort of a puzzle. Now, if we were in the shop, what you would see is that we have lots of furniture that is organized by size, it makes it a little bit easier to um, navigate. The important thing, like the leading, is that the furniture needs to be not type high. I mean, I didn't mention this in the workshop the other day, but there is a standard for type high, at least uh, as of the 19th century, which is 0.918 inches. That's how tall the type and any woodcuts or anything that we wanted to print is. So if you're ever driving down the street and you see a car with a, one of those white oval bumper stickers that says 0.918, you will know that that person is a printer. <laughs> now, before we lock it up, we're actually going to use our hammer just to make sure that all the type is nice and flat. Again, we're working on this wood table, which is probably not the ideal surface for printing. Uh, if we were in the shop, we would have an imposing stone, which is a perfectly flat stone that we can use to make sure that everything is, is brilliantly uh, flat. But we are making do with what we've got, as Joe says. Are you the coin thingy? All right. You want to use the, the key? All right, don't tighten it as tight as you can. Just tighten it a little bit. You don't actually have to overexert pressure. That will make everything start to curve. Nope, no, nope, no more. That's probably funny. Just out. until it feels tight. Yep, let go. And let's see if that's enough, OK? Oh, not quite. So what we're doing, right, is we're just exerting pressure from either side. And you can see that now I can lift it without any of that tight falling. Sorry, it keeps trying to refocus, but I'm going to switch back over to the printer camera. I'm going to pick that guy up. All right, I'm going to put it in for you, OK? And I might have gotten the wrong side again. I keep trying to put it in upside down. Yep, I keep trying to put it in upside down. And I'm just getting to know this printer. I've gotten to know all the quirks and eccentricities of the printer on campus at this point, but this one I am just getting introduced to during all of this. And it has many of its own little quirks and eccentricities, to be sure. Oh, why can't I get it to grab, Joe? Mm -hmm. There we go. I think we're good. Yep. All right, so we're going to, whoa, whoa, you put too much down in there for sure. <laughs> Let's start with just one and see how your, how your composition job is, OK? So we're going to need to do a couple of passes to ink it. Wait, wait, no, you don't need to give it full pressure yet. You need to do a couple of passes just to get a nice layer of ink on that type. Oh, God, this thing's very difficult. All right, now let's give it some pressure, OK? <laughs> Go. Push it all the way down. Good. And we've got a double print because of all that. What is this supposed to say? Um, well, that says the worms are slimy and worms are slimy. Worms are slimy. What did you do with your Y? Oh, no. Just show y'all. It's upside down. Joe set his Y upside down. So we've got, I'm not sure what that now says. But he also was trying to make an emoticon. Uh, I'll show you some examples. In the 19th century, there are lots of printers and compositors who experimented with type to make uh, faces and images and all sorts of things. So that is not an internet phenomenon. You want to fix it? All right, well, let's make one more print as it is, and I'm going to end the recording, and then we can fix it, and you can make a good print, OK? <laughs> so 
So you can see what it looks like. He used the very swooshy Park Avenue font, but I like his uh, emoticon here. And I'm going to stop the recording because we are pretty much at 1030. Well, first I'll see if people have questions and then I'll stop the recording. Um, but we'll fix this uh, afterwards and get a good print for you. Okay, so for those who are here live, I just wonder if folks have any questions. Okay, nothing from the live crowd today. Okay, there's an activity in the book lab uh, ready to go. So y'all can go check that out. Thanks everyone. Bye. Okay, I just want to do a couple more. I was hurrying to get two prints in during the class, but just want to show a final product for this Ken Liu piece, which I'm working on. Still getting weird kind of light inking right there. And so one of the things that can happen on this printer is that it's got little tiny adjustments that can be made. And again, if I was making a few thousand of these, I would uh, tinker with this until I had it just right. It'll be okay if it's not perfect for today, but I do want it to be better. See that as I tinker, it's getting clearer. darker but if I do packing all around it only makes it darker right there I'm actually wondering if it's the type because if I look at it, it's not grabbing ink as much as the other letters are. Huh. Probably the best I've had so far. One thing people like about letterpress these days is that it provides some character right? rather than every print being exactly the same you get slight differences of inking and application to give each print a uniqueness but again that's something a bit ahistorical in that during the letterpress age, printers would have been striving for as consistent a print as they could possibly get. They would not have been striving for marks or things that made prints unique. <laughs> so this is another way in which we have a kind of nostalgia that's um, 
maybe helps preserve the art, but it doesn't uh, necessarily help us understand the historical place of the art or its historical functioning. even making it darker but we're still getting this lightness which makes me feel like it's something with the actual height of the type right there it's not catching ink quite as much as the rest of it at this point i'm just going to decide that that is the character of this print because i'm not going to take over type out right now Thank you. 